Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 102 of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where, with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, we take a deep dive, literally going into the compliance weeds each week to flesh out a topic in a way that no other podcast handles. Before we get to our topic this week, have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Have you ever wondered what it might take to have a podcast? Well, I have founded the Compliance Podcast Network, and I can offer you a platform if you're interested in podcasting. And if you want to learn a little bit how to do it, I suggest you talk to the ladies at One Stone Creative so we have some words from them now. If you are enjoying this show, you might enjoy hosting your own. As an expert in your field, you have skills, knowledge, and insight that can help you expand your practice, meet new people, and create amazing content to share with the world. In as little as two hours a week, you can dramatically change how you promote, fill, and position your business, and One Stone Creative can show you how. Learn more at onestonecreative.net. This week, we take a look at the Rod Rosenstein speech last week at the ACI National FCPA Conference and use that as a starting point for an exploration into CEO criminal liability, senior executive criminal liability, and board of director criminal liability in uh, corruption cases and in cases where there's been more than simply, or not simply rather, uh, control override, but really setting a tone, setting a culture, setting a expectation that lying, cheating, and stealing is acceptable in your organization. It's an interesting philosophical discussion, but it's tied to real-world facts. And certainly the speech by Rosenstein, highlighted by the testimony by Michael Cohen at his sentencing hearing, uh, indicated that uh, having a senior executive or a CEO uh, encourage illegal, unethical, or reputational damaging behavior can significantly uh, damage a company and bring potential civil and indeed criminal liability. I know you'll enjoy this episode. Compliance Into the Weeds is a presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds, where with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, we take a deep dive literally going into the compliance weeds for a topic. And today we have one that I think is going to be not only a lot of fun, but very juicy. So, um, Matt, you reported on or at least blogged on a couple of uh, speeches last week from Department of Justice representatives uh, one of them was a speech by Rod Rosenstein, which modified the Yates memo, uh, moving to something called uh, substantial involvement uh, of uh, people in uh, FCPA violations or employees in FCPA violations as related to corporate disclosures. Uh, you want to take it from there? Yeah, sure, Tom. So as probably many listeners already have heard through the compliance chatter out there, Uh, This was a speech that Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein gave last Thursday at the big FCPA compliance conference, um, which I did not manage to attend, although I was in Washington and I spied on the cocktail hour, but did not go and have any drinks. Um, What Rosenstein said was basically, to your point, you know, they are stepping back from the Yates memos standard that if a company wants any credit at all for cooperation, they must turn over all evidence they can find on any individual involved in misconduct. And Rosenstein now said basically um, that you, if to get cooperation credit, you must provide information on people who are substantially involved in or responsible for the misconduct in question. And if you are making that effort, then you are eligible for some credit. How much? Well, that's going to depend. And um, I think basically Rosenstein and I, I have mixed feelings about this. He's not wrong to say, and he did actually say this in his speech, he says, we're not going to prosecute every single person who has misconduct at every single company. Justice Department doesn't have those resources. It's not a good use of their time. He's not wrong to say that. Um, he is also not wrong to try and reintroduce some discretion to prosecutors to give some credit to companies if they give some sort of information, but not everything people would like. Doesn't that count for something? Come on, Mr. Prosecutor. And, you know, he basically has, I think, given prosecutors a bit more power to say, all right, we'll try and consider it. Again, in theory, 
Uh, if you introduce more discretion for prosecutors to co work with companies that might entice them to step forward and disclose conduct and cooperate, which is what the department wants to do. And frankly, that's what compliance officers should want companies to do anyway. So nice theory that Rod Rosenstein floated. Here is my concern, is that when we're talking about people who are quote, substantially involved in or responsible for misconduct, close quote. What is that actually going to mean for senior executives who I think might be complicit in misconduct because they are helping to create the corporate culture where others think misconduct is the desired behavior? But the senior executive doing that isn't actually engaged in the misconduct himself. I'll give you one example from the corporate world, and then we're going to get to the juicy stuff, I think, with an example from the political world. Um, I was thinking about Rosenstein's policy, and the very first thing that came into my mind is how would this policy have fit with Wells Fargo back in 2016 with their then CEO, John Stumpf, who was fired after the misconduct came out, that thousands and thousands of bank employees were creating fictional customer accounts uh, so they could hit sales quotas that Wells Fargo had spelled out because if they did not hit those quotas, they would be fired. And it was John Stumpf who came up with the little slogan, eight is great. You must sell eight products per day. And then he and his other minions in the senior leadership suite created this corporate culture where the thought was, I have to hit the eight. If I don't, I'm going to get fired. So I'm going to open up an account for John Smith today, even though he didn't say it. I didn't tell him about it. I'm going to close it on the third day of the month afterwards, and I get my quota, and I'm, I'm fine. Now, this, of course, created enormous problems for bank customers, and Wells Fargo did suffer some heavy sanctions, but John Stumpf only lost his job. He did not actually get brought up on any charges. Well, would he be under this Rosenstein policy? Because was he substantially involved in the misconduct there? Because he didn't actually open any accounts on any customers without their permission. He just created a poor control environment that led others to think about, maybe I should commit misconduct because that's what the culture here is telling me I should do. So how would misconduct like that fit with the Rosenstein policy here? I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I'll stop right there and just let you kind of riff off that, Tom. But that, that was the very first thing I thought about is that we have this nebulous realm of senior leaders who might foster misconduct, might be complicit in it, but they're not substantially involved. And I don't know how these two things square. I'd be eager to hear what you think. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to channel my inner Henry II by opining, uh, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? <laughs> uh, that's kind of level number one, but I don't think we're quite to that level yet because actually at the end you persuaded me with um, uh, fostering an either an in, in, incomplete control environment or a control environment that can be over, uh, easily overridden. I think it's still a level down from active involvement. Mm -hmm. And my sentence from the Rosenstein talk, at least um, – you know, I read the transcript today uh, in preparation for a blog post. Uh, it seemed to me that they were really going to focus more on those who engaged in active conduct. We haven't we haven't seen a robust prosecution under any memo or policy from those who were involved through uh, basically tacitly looking the other way or creating or fostering. I think was the word you used. Uh, a control environment which allowed uh, the violations to happen. So I, I think at this point, that's a level of, I don't want to say sophistication, perhaps nuance and prosecution that we have not yet seen. It may be because there's still so much low-hanging fruit in terms of active participants or companies that clearly violated the law, or it may be uh, because of uh, the resource to, resources have to go against a person individually who may have uh, tacitly uh, agreed to or tacitly suggested um, and the trouble you would have in front of a jury proving that. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, you know, the, the sticking problem then for ethics and compliance officers is that even if somebody might say, 
it's not the Justice Department's job to file criminal charges over a poor control environment and to haul a CEO in. Maybe that's not their job. Well, if it isn't their job, somebody somewhere has to be thinking about that on the government or law enforcement or policymaking side, because that is actually what the public thinks about. And the public, we talk about them in some sort of abstract. They are also the employees at large organizations. So here you are, ethics and compliance officer, running around telling people it is so important to be ethical and that we have to have an ethical culture. But if we still have this gaping hole in the oversight framework that you could have somebody like Stom, John Stumpf foster this um, you know, terrible attitude at Wells Fargo and create so much damage, but there are really, you know, there aren't that many consequences for him. There's no criminal consequences. Um, is that the right outcome. And I don't know if it is or it isn't, but I know that the public would look at a lot of that and say, yet again, it's the people at the top with all the money who get off scot-free, even when they blunder into making a tremendous mess at the company where they are. And I'm not being too glib when I say that, because those words came to me from another compliance officer over the weekend, where I asked that person, What do you think of this policy from Rosenstein and how might it fit with John Stump and Wells Fargo? And that compliance officer shot back, you know, it's just another thing of the people at the top with all the money get away with it. Now, this is from somebody trained to be more thoughtful and nuanced about this. And the the person generally is. But if compliance officers are that cynical and we're running around telling employees don't be that cynical, like, the employees are going to know which end is up, and it's going to make our jobs much harder if we don't address this sort of a thing. And one other statistic I'll throw out there is that um, your board runs around all the time thinking about the importance of being a trustworthy organization. So customers and consumers and the public and the markets will all know that they can trust our brand not to be jerks or clumsy or unethical or anything like that. Well, we are doing a terrible job at that as corporations. Uh, According to the Edelman Trust Barometer that came out last January, the average American right now, only 48% of America has trust or would consider businesses to be trustworthy. A majority of Americans do not think companies are trustworthy. That has real implications for brand value. It has real implications for regulatory overreach, as in Dodd-Frank, when we had a tremendous mess with the financial crisis. So what happened? New people came into Congress. We went nuts with the Dodd-Frank Act, which I generally think is good, but there are flaws in it. But you have these sudden lurches in regulatory oversight that are not too good, but that's the response when people don't trust large organizations. And right now they don't. And right now, according to the Rod Rosenstein policy, we still have this glaring weakness about how would we try to sanction people, say, John Stumpf and Wells Fargo, people such as Travis Kalanick and Uber, where he was a terrible CEO who let all sorts of misconduct go on because he fostered an awful corporate culture. But was Travis Kalanick involved in directly every single type of misconduct that Uber experienced? I don't think so. I don't know that he was substantially involved in or responsible for that misconduct, but that misconduct was was a product of the corporate culture at Uber. And he was responsible for the culture. So, do we go after him or not? If if the Justice Department doesn't go after him or some other CEO in that way, um, then who does? Is this something where are we going to have auditors be looking at corporate culture and the control environment more strenuously and skeptically, which we should? Uh, is this a job for shareholders suing the board for neglect of the corporate culture because there is no other recourse? But You know, people want to see senior executives punished when there is corporate misconduct. And if senior executives don't like that, guys, that's the job. If you don't like it, don't take the job. But this is what people want. And it seems like right now we don't have the mechanisms in place to address that adequately. And that's going to make the ethics and compliance officer's job of preaching the gospel of good conduct that much harder. So on the... Individual prosecution of senior executives, uh, kind of channeling my lawyerness, 
the reason I don't think we see that is lack of intent. Mm-hmm. In the criminal world, there must be intent um, unless you negligently murder someone uh, and engage, or engage in manslaughter. So typically there has to be intent or, or such a wanton and reckless disregard that that's equivalent of uh, violating the law. And uh, right now, uh, I don't think you can make that step or we haven't made that step where uh, fostering an environment where you say, oh, don't break the law, but we're not going to put any controls in place to pr- prevent, detect, or remediate, uh, that's not su- sufficient intent. Um, the uh, one, one, uh, I've read the uh, speeches last week, and one you did re- uh, were present for and did report on, on John Cronin, and a couple of things s- stuck with me or struck me, at least from the text of his remarks, was that he said the purpose of, for the Department of Justice was to deter uh, wrongdoing, and that they did. Uh, it seems to me, though, that they're de- uh, defining wrongdoing as intentional acts, uh, and that to me is consistent with uh, criminal acts. Now, mm-hmm. it's very different on the civil side, and that's where I think the SEC could be more robust because they are uh, uh, not required to have the uh, criminal intent that the. De- Department of Justice is certainly in the FCPA arena, and that there could be more uh, enforcement there, but that is not going to be a criminal enforcement. That's going to be a civil fine or penalty, uh, or perhaps you could keep them from uh, being involved in a public company, uh, as they tried to do with uh, Mr. Musk at one point. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, uh, I guess I'm stuck on the intent, Matt, and unless you have an affirmative uh, duty or an affirmative showing that they were intentionally involved in the conduct. I just can't make that make it to a criminal uh, criminal action. I, I I agree with all of that, and um, I think that this calls out that fundamental tension between the legal department and the ethics and compliance department, which are not the same. I know so many of you answer into legal, or your compliance officer at the top is the general counsel. Anyways, just because you do it that way doesn't mean that they are, in fact, the same thing. They are different things with different interests and priorities. And this comes back to you know the great saying from um, Law & Order, the source of all great legal wisdom in this country, um, where there was a judge who once told D.A. Jack McCoy, there is a difference between being right, which I think, Tom, you are, and Rod Rosenstein is in your analysis, and doing right, which is what people want to see at their companies that they work at or invest in or do business in. And doing right is not necessarily always matching up with what law it currently is here. And to your point about maybe the SEC could have more um, purchase in pursuing cases like this, I also think that is true, except the SEC will generally say that, oh, yeah, what the Justice Department said about enforcement, we do that too, just on the civil side, but we have the same standard. So, would we see the SEC also then um, start to adopt the Rosenstein policy, even if in its own civil enforcement? I don't know, but we could. We, because I remember when the Yates memo came out, um, the SEC right away said, "Oh yeah, us too. We do that, and that's our standard." Well, then okay. Now that the Yates memo has been, we've taken a step back from it at Justice. Will the SEC again say, "Oh yeah, us too. That's our standard." Um, You know, it remains to be seen. There is an awful lot of confusion around this. Um, And that then, you know, I I still have the political example, Tom, we haven't talked about yet. Do we want to drop this on our readers, on our listeners? Oh, I think we have to. So the political example that came about, of course, is, wait for it, President Trump and his former fixer, Michael Cohen, who you might recall last Friday, I think it was, pleaded guilty to one charge of lying to Congress, uh, where Michael Cohen was testifying in front of, I think, the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, And he said that originally he had told the Senate committee that all talk about Donald Trump doing business in Moscow ceased in January of 2016. And last Friday, he admitted that was a lie when he told the Senate that. That actually talks continued well into July of 2016 when Donald Trump was going to be the Republican nominee. Well, then, why did he lie to the Senate when he first said that? Michael Cohen was explicit that 
Donald Trump didn't tell him to lie. Donald Trump only was saying all of these things about how I didn't do any business there. This is totally false. This is a witch hunt, blah, blah, blah. We've all heard Donald Trump and his nonsense. Um, and Michael Cohen, it took those words, heard that tone, interpreted that control environment as saying, well, therefore, I guess I should be lying to the Senate as I'm testifying. That fits with what I just laid out here earlier on this podcast is, again, was Donald Trump substantially involved in the misconduct of Michael Cohen lying to the Senate? No, I don't think he told Michael Cohen explicitly, you have to lie. I mean, with the way the Trump administration goes, who knows? I, we might live to eat those words. But let's take Michael Cohen at his word. The president, the senior executive of the Trump organization, did not tell him to commit a crime. But Michael Cohen looked up at the top, saw what the top was saying, read the control environment and said, well, therefore, then, based on that control environment, I should commit misconduct here and I'm going to lie to the Senate. So Michael Cohen was guilty. He pleaded guilty. He did it. There's no question about that. Where was the liability for Donald Trump? Because there would be an awful lot of people in this country who would say he is corrupt and therefore we want justice. I mean, we just witnessed an election that had the blue wave come in specifically because people find Donald Trump to be a distrustful, lying character, which I believe that he is. So how would a policy like this with Rod Rosenstein enforcing against people substantially involved in the misconduct, how would it work there? Donald Trump is clearly substantially involved in setting the control environment that anybody on his side is always going to lie. And then we have evidence now of somebody who did lie, basically on Donald Trump's behalf, without Donald Trump telling him. How does how would all of this misconduct fit with the Rosenstein policy? Because if you would then turn around and say Donald Trump didn't do anything wrong, I don't think a large a majority of Americans would believe that. And if you're going to say, well, Donald Trump might have been pretty sketchy, but he didn't break the law, that's going to sit very distastefully in a lot of people's mouths. Um, and then it leads to public distrust in U.S. public institutions, which also, according to Edelman, is in the tank right now. Why would we be surprised if this is what we're doing? And if you are an ethics and compliance officer trying to build trust and trying to argue for ethical conduct and getting people to care that that's important, all of this makes your job really hard. So I guess that really gives me the opportunity to tie back to a point you raised uh, really close, much closer to the start of this podcast, Matt, and that was the John Stump example at Wells Fargo. Um, he did lose his job. Uh, he has not been criminally sanctioned. Uh, as, uh, as far as we know, he's not under criminal investigation. Uh, he may not uh, ever sustain a criminal uh, indictment. But for the company, there has been a significant cost. It was a multi-billion dollar loss uh, in market cap. There was a, turns out, relatively pittance of a fine of, uh, I think, $185 million, But they reserved over $2 billion uh, just to uh, investigate and remediate and uh, pay off shareholder lawsuits. And then on top of that, the Fed put a market cap on them, or rather a growth cap on them. And um, I guess what the compliance officers uh, – argument is or should be is that uh, you, Mr. CEO, may not be criminally prosecuted, but our company value and your st shareholder value, your stakeholder value will drop and you may not be around uh, if the board decides to make a change. And that's why we need to have a robust ethics and compliance program with robust controls that are not easily overridden. I would agree with all of that. I just am not entirely sure how often the public out there will be convinced that that is sufficient. Um, you know, we've all heard those uh, complaints about the financial crisis where, you know, no CEOs ever went to jail. Well, you know, should they have gone to jail? If so, why should they have gone to jail? What law did they break? At least clearly right now, it seems like the Justice Department believed they didn't break a law or they couldn't successfully prosecute any bank CEOs. But Ask the public generally, should somebody somewhere have gone to jail for the financial crisis? And, you know, I think the large majority of them would say yes. And I think a large majority of them are more jaded now because nobody actually did. And 
we as a society have to square all of that and come up with a more cohesive way to think about corporate misconduct um, and holding the right people accountable in the right ways. And I still I can envision scenarios where the Rosenstein policy isn't going to hold enough water with enough people in the public, in your workforce, in your consumer base and all of that really to to reverse the declines in trust that we are seeing in large organizations. And if the trust keeps going down, it's always going to make the chief ethics and compliance officer's job harder. And that's that's something we have to think about. Matt, you said something that really struck me there, and it's way too long for the title of this podcast, but I think it's uh, an incredibly uh, prescient observation. Quote, need more cohesive way to think about corporate misconduct, end quote. And uh, I think that, to me, hits exactly on the head. The struggles I've articulated in this podcast are because I don't have a cohesive way to think about criminal liability with intent in a structure that is designed to diffuse authority as the corporate structure is uh, and really make it so there is no one person who makes every decision. And that even if a a decision around uh, controls or culture or environment is made uh, that leads to uh, negative or even illegal actions by uh, an underling, that the person who fostered that environment is not has has not uh, seen uh, criminal liability in the past. So you're absolutely spot on. We do need a more cohesive way to think about this. We do, and you know, I should say I credit Ron um, Ron Rosenstein for trying to come up with this policy, which unto itself, I'm not really necessarily opposed to it, because in individual cases, I think it could be quite good. However. In other individual cases, I don't think this is going to do people many favors. And that's really the challenge here. Like I said, we need a cohesive way to do this. So I don't want to think people to think I'm just punching on Rod Rosenstein. I'm not. But I am, I think, expressing a, the frustration out there that many people have that we don't have a solid sense of how we hold people accountable for misconduct when it happens at a corporation, like who is really going to be responsible? And if we don't have a good answer for that question, ethics and compliance officers have a harder job. And that that is the beginning and end of it. Well, Matt, that seems like a great place to stop uh, uh, this podcast. This has just been an incredibly uh, great exploration of a uh, both a philosophical and tangible topic. So I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Fox again, and I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email Matt at Matt M. Kelly at RadicalCompliance.com. I'm found at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I hope you will have a joyous and safe holiday season this year as this is being posted on Wednesday, December 5th. I hope you'll join us again next week where Matt and I take another deep dive going into the weeds of a compliance or compliance-related topic. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.